right, good morning. Uh, so my name is Corinne O, oh, and what Greg talked about was a great segue into what we want to talk about today. And we've titled our talk today, A Better Approach to Treatment Planning for Thoracic Cancers. And why is that? Well, let's be honest, the area of the thorax is a challenging area for planning. Uh, it's not your typical spherical prostate where you can just slap on five fields and call it a day. Thoracic tumors are often regular in shape, can be pretty extensive in terms of size. And on top of that, we have to think about um, cord proximity and other organs at risk. And on top of that, we have to worry about air in inhomogeneity. So there's a lot of thought and preliminary workup we have to do as planners in order to develop an optimal plan. Now, when we think about innovation and newer techniques, we're somewhat conditioned to think that these newer techniques are probably better. Uh, more recent technologies, such as IMRT and VMAT, hold the promise of better dosimetry and higher therapeutic ratio. And although IMRT and VMAT uh, are much, indeed, much more sophisticated in their delivery than, con uh, than conventional techniques, what we found is that no single modality was best for all patients. Uh, in fact, what we found is that each case demanded a methodical and customized approach to treatment planning. So what we want to talk about today is talk about different techniques, compare some results, and leave you with some tips in the area specifically of the lung and the esophagus. So let's run through our outline first. Um, so before we get into it, we'll do that. Uh, about our practice, we'll tell you about where we're from. We'll then move on to the progression of radiation therapy, the improvements that we've made and shapes the way that we practice today. And based on a few available techniques, namely 3D conformal, IMRT, and VMAT, the gains as well as the trade-offs that we've had to make. Uh, presentation objective, what we'd like for you to take away from our presentation and possibly incorporate into your own practices. Hybrid planning, we'll discuss the combination and how the integration of dual techniques can provide an optimal plan. And before we jump to the case examples, uh, we'll, we'll discuss some of the technical specifics, such as the planning system, localization methods, and some of the benchmark goals we set to follow. Uh, and then my colleague, Phil, will wrap up the presentation by talking about some several case examples that will demonstrate the practical approach of everything that I've talked about. Since we, since we do have a lot to cover, uh, we do ask that you hold questions until the end of the presentation. So a broader practice. So Advanced Radiation Centers, or ARC, is located in the New York metropolitan area. I think there are some New Yorkers, New Yorkers in the room uh, that you know, we've met today. And we're part of a larger division called Integrated Medical Professionals, a multi-specialty group formed by, uh, in 2006 by community physicians um, and now consists of over 600 people. So what once was a single site in Long Island uh, five years ago is now comprised of six freestanding facilities, three of which are located in Long Island, two in the Hudson Valley, and one in the Bronx, making us the largest private practice in New York. We have nine radiation oncologists, five board-certified physicists, five CMDs, 24 therapists, five simulation therapists, and 20 support staff. So let's go down, get on to the uh, advances of radiotherapy. So what's the greatest challenge for radiation therapy or any cancer therapy? And that's to attain the highest uh, probability of cure with the least morbidity. Uh, the simplest way in theory to increase the therapeutic ratio is to encompass all cancer cells with sufficient doses of radiation while minimizing the amount of radiation to normal tissue. So in practice, however, we are challenged to identify these cancer cells while um, effectively targeting, that, targeting them with radiation. So as you can see from our timeline over the past decade, a lot of progress has been made on both fronts. Uh, technical improvements in the application of x-rays, CTs, MRIs, PET imaging, um, electronic portal imaging, and our understanding of their limitations has greatly improved our ability to identify uh, tumors. Although we became aware that uh, the position of target most motion, such as lung volumes, can be highly variable and mobile, we were poorly equipped to compensate for this motion. Uh, similarly, when treating head and neck, we knew that high doses to the salivary glands caused dry mouth and poor dental health, but we were unable to reduce uh, these side effects without 
risking a compromising cure. So modern radiotherapy has evolved a lot from nonspecific techniques using bony anatomy and hand-drawn blocking towards more specialized planning incorporating 3D uh, reconstructions of images and computer op optimization algorithms. And corresponding to these changes, there has been specialization in the types of technology used for uh, different cancer sites. For example, the um, obvious advantages associated with sparing the salivary glands has pushed IMRT as the standard treatment for head and neck uh, faster than any other cancer site. And a different set of strategies required to uh, address the organ movement and set up our problems associated with the treatment of prostate cancer. And respiratory movements associated with lung cancer has also resulted in the development of unique site-specific solutions. So given all these uh, advances in the interest of our talk today, we'll be talking specifically about the thoracic region and the modern uh, perspectives of 3D, IMRT, and VMAT. So some of the gains and limitations. So the move from 2D to 3D in the 80s was a major advance because it took into account axial anatomy and complex tissue contours, such as the hourglass shape of the neck and the shoulders. We're now able to view 3D images of tumors, uh, normal structures, and create reliable dose distributions off this data. Beams I view technology in which the beam is shaped from multiple angles using MLCs allows for evaluation of the treated doses as a function of dose and volume uh, uh, called a dose volume histogram, as you are all aware. Traditionally, treatment for a lung consists of an APPA with an off cord uh, using uh, opposed obliques. For the esophagus, typical field consists of a three-field arrangement, whether it's an AP and two obliques or a PA and two laterals, and some may even opt for a four-field box. Tumor miss is relatively low, so long as it's not too irregular in its shape, and calculation and treatment delivery are relatively quick. But we're still hindered by hot spots and normal tissue and the tolerance of critical structures, thereby preventing us from really pushing boundaries with tumor dose escalation. So then in the 1990s comes IMRT. IMRT was introduced. Compared to 3D, IMRT provides greater flexibility in controlling each beam, ultimately improving dose distributions and reducing toxicity. By modulating the number of um, fields and the intensity of radiation within each field, we're now able to, we now have the ability to sculpt dose. Uh, advanced treatment planning software furthered our ability to modulate this dose. Instead of the clinician choosing each beam and waiting, the computer optimization techniques can now help to determine the distribution of beam intensity across a treatment volume. So IMRT now allows for dose escalation, delivering higher doses to the tumor while maintaining acceptable doses to critical organs at risk, thereby allowing for future radiation as well. However, the benefits at IM, of IMRT do come at a cost. So the first, more complex, requiring a verification QA. Secondly, it's been argued of the possibility of increased and integral dose, where a larger volume of normal tissue is receiving a low dose of radiation. And this possibility of increased and integral dose has also led to some concerns about secondary malignancy. And thirdly, there can be a substantial amount of time that it takes to send the information to the treatment machine, rotate the gantry, set the field, verify that field, uh, which has also led to concerns about the tumor cell repair during the time in order to deliver treatment. So ARC therapy. Over the past decade, ARC therapies have gained widespread clinical interest addressing some of the limitations uh, of fixed field treatment. So in 2007, VMAP was introduced, allowing for gantry rotation uh, and dose rate variation while the beam is on. Currently, there's three commercially available VMAT systems, Elective VMAT, Philips SmartArc, and Varian's RapidArc. And for the remainder of the presentation, when we talk about uh, VMAT, we will be talking specifically about RapidArc. So the major conceptual advantage of, of this type of therapy over standard fixed field IMRT is that since the radiation source is roaching around the patient, all angles are able to uh, deliver radiation to the target while minimizing um, the dose to the critical structures. Treatment times have been shown to be shorter than with a fixed field IMRT, generally reporting the range of one to three minutes for a standard two gray fractionation with rapid arc. 
So given that the volumetric techniques, by definition, can generally treat the whole target at once, it follows that the treatment to um, using the, ra uh, the rapid arc should be faster and more efficient. And in essence, modern arc therapies are a form of IMRT. And theoretically, they retain the same advantages and disadvantages over 3D cheating off improve um, dose symmetry for more dose to a greater volume of tissue. So presentation objective. What I've talked about uh, is, is everything that you, you are already aware of. And our objective today is to provide an all-inclusive treatment planning approach to the thoracic area. And what do we mean by that? Well, given some of the options that we have, more specifically in our case, 3D, IMRT, and VMAT, can we yield a plan that really gains from the 3D as well as the VMAT and the IMRT, what we'll term as a hybrid plan? We believe that the fusion of dual techniques can provide an opportunity to promote the best of both worlds, adopting the benefits of the 3D as well as optimizing and using the advantages of the IMRT or VMAT. So some of you may be wondering, well, are you claiming that this hybrid method is better than your typical uh, single, single treatment technique that you um, traditionally employ? And that's really not the case at all. Uh, what we want to show is that depending upon the cir uh, circumstances such as tumor location, shape, the size, patient comorbidities, physician discretion, uh, there are certain technique, techniques that can be proved to be of more benefit in, uh, than others, and another alternative may include the adoption of a hybrid, because sometimes you want to strike a balance between the two techniques. Uh, now, this is not a new concept. There have been papers out there that have talked about this idea, and I'm sure um, some of you in the audience are already aware of this type of technique. So uh, for those of you who are not aware, we really want to be able to demonstrate the advantages of this technique. So hybrid planning. Uh, so the hybrid plan in our clinic simply refers to a composite plan, typically from our experience, an APPA arrangement or an off cord in conjunction with an IMRT or VMAT. So when you first start planning, you generally want to get the best 3D plan as possible. Now, if you're struggling to get a decent 3D plan, for instance, if you're not able to get um, tumor coverage or if you're having a problem trying to minimize dose to critical structures, that's typically a sign that you want to move more towards an IMRT or VMAT weighted hybrid um, or just strictly or VMAT uh, or IMRT alone. So here's a general map of how it works. When we're talking about the hybrid, the contribution from each technique is defined by dose. So in our top example, if we have a prescribed fractionation at 200 centigrade per day, and we want 50% contribution from the 3D and 50% contribution from the VMAT, or IMRT rather, uh, we would do just that. We would split the dose, giving 100 centigrade from each technique. Similarly, if we take that same fractionation, we want 30% contribution from the 3D and 30%, I'm sorry, 70% contribution from the VMAT, we would weight 60 centigrade from the 3D and 140 centigrade from the VMAT. So in our clinic, we we've typically abided by the 70-30 rule of thumb. No more than 70% contribution and no less than 30% should come from one single technique. We feel that once you exceed this um, balance, you really lose the benefits from the complementary technique. So the great thing about this concept is that you're not limited to what we're showing you on this slide. You have a lot of different opportunities. You might want to use a wedge pair in conjunction with an IMRT if you have a posterior lesion, or you might want to use a single anterior field with a VMAT if you have an anterior lesion. So there's a lot of different possibilities with this technique, allowing the planner a lot of freedom and control. So as a general visual, on the left side of the screen, you'll see the first part of our hybrid technique, which is the APPA fields. Now, it would be great to just treat with the APPA in order to really control the dose to the lungs. But we all know that the standard dose for tumor control for the thoracic area exceeds uh, 45 gray. And that we're limited by our uh, core dose uh, because of that. And that's where the VMAT or the IMRT really comes in. So by incorporating this secondary technique, we're able to control the spinal cord dose while gaining the benefits of the 3D's ability to control the lung. So on the right side of the screen, you'll see the VMAT. Using the APPA uh, field as a base dose plan. So we typically start out with an even split of dose or 50% contribution from each technique. However, as mentioned previously, this by no means limits us 
and adjusting the weighting further. Depending on the tumor location, the shape and the size, uh, patient comorbidities, uh, things of that nature, we might, adjusting the, we might adjust the weighting to get um, a more acceptable final plan. So, for example, if the patient presented with uh, poor pulmonary function, we might weight the fields more from the EPPA than from the VMAT or the IMRT. And on the contrary, if the physician wanted more, uh, a more conformal plan, we might adjust our weighting to give more from the VMAT. So here we have our merged VMAT hybrid plan. And again, for those centers who don't possess the uh, capabilities of VMAT, you're still able to use step and shoot or sliding window IMRT in order to get an optimal plan as well. So technical briefing. Uh, so before Phil gets into some case examples, let's go over some of the technicalities of our analysis and the benchmark goals we set to follow. So all planning was done using Eclipse Treatment Planning Software version 8.9. All plans were treated or planned to uniform daily dose of 2 gray per fraction for 30 fractions, totaling 60 gray. Target dose criteria was as follows. 100% of the CTV was to receive 100% of the prescribed dose, and 95% of the PTV was to receive the prescription dose as well. When possible, a maximum hotspot of 120% was set in accordance with RTOG 0839, but exceeding this limit would be, understood, would be understood in order to spare organs at risk if needed. Six MV photons were used in the area of the thorax due to the secondary buildup um, effect of targets in air and the deeper DMAX for higher energies. All plans were generated with heterogeneity, heterogeneity corrections on using AAA algorithm. And in terms of localization, we use daily comb beam CT to verify the setup as well as inter and intrafractional target motion. So when available, using uh, 40 gating studies and PET, PET CT scans were performed and then fused to our planning CT using Velocity, a fusion software program to better define the hypermetabolic uh, lesion. And coincidentally enough, I believe that Velocity is providing the lunch symposium uh, right after our talk. So, uh, so the use of our gating study was to obtain real-time target motion in order to reduce the planning margins to, uh, in order, um, planning margins with which to treat with, uh, more specifically the MIP scan. So for those who are not familiar with what a MIP scan is, it refers to the maximum intensity projection scan. And this is a visualization method for 3D imaging data used to delineate the GTV and CTV as well as the margin required for the PTV. So a bit of history, although originally called the maximum activity projection used for nuclear medicine, it is now widely employed in radiology and in particular for 4D CT. So, during the 4D image acquisition, the scan extracts information continuously during a time interval equivalent to a breathing cycle. The system can then reconstruct retrospectively 10 CT sets, each of them representing an acquisition along the same breathing phase. Therefore, we can get a 10 CT scan equivalent to 10 breath hold positions. So for the study, all plans were planned using MD-specific margins, typically ranging from 1 to 2 cm. So the dose constraints listed in their hierarchies were analyzed using RTOG 0839 as a guide. So the spinal cord will always be our first priority, and generally that could be followed by the combined lung, esophagus, and heart. So for the preceding cases, the best plans were chosen mainly in accordance with the protocol, along with some in-house criteria, which are not listed but include the conformality index, which I'll define a little bit later, as well as the V5 and the V10 for the total lung. Uh, although RTOG spinal cord necessitates dose less than 50.5 gray, ARC's policy is to adhere to a cord dose that does not exceed 45 gray, so our analyses will preserve our in-house criteria. We also want to touch upon the normal tissue complication probabilities. So between models such as Amami, RTOG, and Quantec, there's a lot of information out there that talks about um, this area. So let's first talk about the lung. So in clinical practice, DVH parameters, such as the mean lung dose and the V20, are the most commonly used predictors for radiation-induced lung in injury. But how many of you out there look at the V5 and the V10 for the total lung? 
Okay, so that's a good amount of you. So clinical studies have suggested that the V5 to V40 parameters are latent predictors to identify patients at risk for this injury. Uh, clinical studies have suggested, um, I'm sorry, clinical studies have suggested that V5 to V40 parameters are latent predictors, uh, especially due to the lung's ability to recover from low doses of radiation, though this would also depend upon the patient's comorbidities. So in addition to the mean and the V20 parameters that the RTOG 0839 recommends, we also believe that the V5 and the V10 um, can also provide to be uh, of importance. So we'll be talking about these parameters in our future case evaluations as well. So in terms of the mean, as you'll see from the lower graph, Quantec demonstrates the mean lung dose of 7 gray correlates to a toxicity rate of 5% um, for symptomatic pneumonitis. If we approximately double this mean to 13 gray, the toxicity rate also doubles to 10%. However, if we double the mean again, the risk increases fourfold. So it appears that the incidence and severity of pneumonitis appears to rise exponentially as the mean dose increases. Similarly, the clinical and dosimetric predictors of acute and late esophagitis have been particularly important. So treatments in the area of the thorax often exposes the esophagus to high levels of radiation. After two to three weeks of conventionally fractured RT, patients often complain of dysphagia um, that usually worsens towards the end of treatment. Uh, this can in turn cause dehydration and weight loss. We can also cause um, treatment interruptions. And again, there's a lot of data out there. Although the RTOG protocol adheres to a mean dose less than 40 gray, Quantec estimates that in order to minimize the risk of grade 3 plus esophagitis, we should adhere to a mean dose of less than 34 gray. So in terms of the heart, so while the data regarding RT-induced cardiovascular disease and lung cancer patients is limited, uh, the cardiotoxic toxic effects of RT has been thoroughly documented in the areas of patients been tr who have been treated with breast cancer and Hodgkin's disease. So in a recent review, radiation tolerance doses for several late effects, including pericarditis and cardiomyopathy, have been estimated between 30 and 40 gray. In order to minimize the risk of pericarditis, Quantec estimates the toxicity rate can be minimized to less than 15%, so as long as the mean heart dose doesn't exceed 26%, and the V30 doesn't exceed a 46% volume. Similarly, in order to reduce the risk of long-term cardiac mortality to less than 1%, the V25 should not exceed 10% of the volume. And just to reiterate, there's a lot of studies out there, and this is just one model. And for the consistency of our case study, we adhere to our TOG's uh, estimates for all organs at risk. So a wing board and alpha cradle are used for patient setup and immobilization. And when possible, patients are generally positioned with their arms up in order to, deliver, uh, in order to avoid delivering dose to these areas. Ooh, and that didn't work. All right. So in terms of um, the optimized plans, a total of five plans were compared for each, for each individual cases in our examples. So it's not showing some technical difficulties, but 3D, IMRT, VMAT, and the hybrids. So our goal was to achieve the best possible plan per planning technique. Uh, once we had all five optimal plans, we then evaluated all doses, uh, all dose criteria to determine what we, what we believed was the best overall plan. All right, that worked. Okay, so in terms of evaluations, we specifically looked at the organs at risk, PTV coverage, and, and conformality. So conformality was measured using an established approach that takes the ratio of the prescription isodose volume and the PTV volume called the conformality index. Although a value of one equates to ideal conformality, this figure can vary significantly depending on the technique chosen. For example, intuitively, a 3D conformal case would likely have a higher conformality index than the IMRT or the VMAT. So to generalize, a normal deviation constitutes anywhere between one to two CM. A minor deviation is defined if greater than two or less than one. And a major deviation corresponds to a value greater than 2.5 or less than, one, uh, less than 0 0.9. So with all that said, I will hand it over to our awesome chief dosimetrist, uh, who will discuss four practical case examples. Good 
Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Phil Olivieri. And uh, for this portion of the presentation, uh, we plan to bore the hell out of you. No, I'm not kidding. Um, on a serious note, though, uh, we instead want to take you through some of our case examples, uh, all of which presented with their own unique uh, presentations of you know, tumor location, tumor shape, and as Corinne alluded, uh, patient comorbidities. Patient one is a 79-year-old male who originally presented in, this, uh, in January of this year with hemoptysis. A CT scan demonstrated uh, a, a left upper lobe mass. He further went under. He further went underwent bronchoscopy and was found to have an obstructing lesion of the left main stem bronchus, biopsy of which revealed uh, positive for non-small cell carcinoma. Now I'd like to focus your attention on the contour evaluations. As you'll see, the CTV and PTV overlap several OARs, including but not limited to the heart, the esophagus, and the uh, greater vessels, in this instance, the aorta. Um, you can see also that the spinal cord uh, is several centimeters away, which proved to be uh, a defining point in our end result. Uh, also, please note that there is uh, a fair amount of PTV in the air, which can be challenging for some of our uh, planning modalities. Uh, if you look from left to right, we have our five plans. Uh, you'll see our 3D CRT plan was just simply composed of an APPA plan. Uh, immediately next to that is our IMRT, which consisted of a five field ipsilateral uh, field arrangement. Uh, in the middle, you have a VMAP plan, which was, again, two partial arcs uh, contained all to the ipsilateral side. And finally, our 50-50 weighted IMRT hybrid, and finally, our hybrid VMAP, again, 50-50 weighted. Now we're going to start looking at some of the plan criteria. Here you'll notice that all the plans were able to meet the 95-100% the, uh, constraint. Um, and if I have you focus your attention to the bottom of the screen, though, you'll see that the 3D CRT plan was amongst the worst in terms of its conformality, with nearly three times the level, which is equating to more normal tissue receiving the prescribed isotopes. Next, we'll look at the spinal cord plus five millimeters. And in this case, all plans were able to meet that constraint. Again, we feel that the main reason for that was simply the fact that the target volume was well away from the, uh, the, tar the, the spinal cord. Next, we have our combined lung dose, which in this case then becomes our most uh, prioritized structure. And you'll, if you can notice, I know that it's a little busy, but the 3D CRT plan really outperformed all the other planning modalities, you know, in terms of V5, V10, and V20. Um, as well as the mean lung dose. Here we have the esophagus, and again, the 3D CRT plan uh, gave us the lowest mean doses with respect to the esophagus, while the IMRT and VMAP plans yielded the highest mean doses. I would like to point out, though, all of them were able to meet the constraints. Next, we have the heart. Um, it does look rather busy here, and in this particular instance, the 3D CRT plan uh, generated the highest mean lung uh, doses that were uh, that we were looking at, while the IMRT and VMAT satisfied the lowest of all criteria. So this brings us to our key points for the patient number one, and I think one of the most important things is just the location of the tumor itself. Uh, you'll see again. I'll mention this is a peripheral lesion, so that the spinal cord was no longer an issue. And if you look at our OER hierarchy, we crossed out the spinal cord just because all planning modalities easily met that constraint. Um, we felt that the plan that did the best in terms of the lung uh, constraint was the 3D CRT plan. And that ultimately swayed us in our direction for the best plan. As far as planning trade-offs, everyone here is familiar that when you're doing plans, trade-offs are made routinely. And sometimes you have to sacrifice one thing for another. And in this case, we felt that sacrificing the conformality and max point dose constraints for lung sparing was of significant importance. 
So without further ado, the best overall plan we felt was the 3 CRT plan. Uh, it had the lowest spinal cord dose, lowest combined lung dose, lowest combined esophageal dose. And um, so it, our choice would be the 3D CRT plan. However, if your physician wasn't happy with the conformality or the hotspots you know, exceeding 120%, then perhaps our rule of thumb 70-30 weighted hybrid plan could be utilized. This brings us to our next patient. She was a 55-year-old female who, 55-year-old uh, female non-smoker who initially presented with an abnormality noted on a chest CT done for screening prior to a possible procedure in the umbilical region. A CTV, a chest CT revealed a right upper lobe lesion measuring 4.2 by 3.8 by 3.4 centimeters with an irregularly shaped mass abutting the superior aspect of the right major fissures with slight linear extension towards the medial posterior pleural surface suspicious for malignancy. Whew. There was also scattered tiny nodules in all the lobes and now we're going to look at her case example and her contour evaluation. So the first thing you might notice is that the ipsilateral lung is completely collapsed and this really forced our hand in terms of trying to spare the contralateral lung. Um, you'll also notice that the entire PTV encompasses the trachea and parts of the esophagus and the spinal cord is there but again we have some distance uh, between the PTV and spinal cord. Another issue was that this lesion was extended so far superior that the shoulders became an issue. Now how many facilities here worry about exiting and entering through the shoulders? Excellent. Uh, I just wanted to see that because I was curious to know that many other facilities do that. When we look at the plans in this particular instance, we had again a 3D CRT plan, which in this instance was uh, an LAO and an RPO with wedges. We had a five-field ipsilateral plan that completely was off the shoulders. We had two ipsilateral partial arcs again. And finally, our 3D CRT and IMRT hybrid, and our hybrid VMAT, again, 50-50 weighting. <clears throat> okay. This brings us to our PTV. And again, all PTVs, all planning techniques met the PTV constraints. And if you look at the bottom again, oh, sorry. If you look at the bottom again, where is this mouse? If you look at the 3D CRT plan again, the conformality index was much higher than any other planning modality. So again, more normal tissue receiving the prescription dose in comparison to the other modalities. Here we have the spinal cord and you can see our threshold of 50 gray. And some of the planning modalities actually were very close but still they all satisfied the cord constraints. Next we have our combined lung and for the most part they were all very low in terms of combined lung sparing or contralateral lung sparing. Um, but again, the 3D CRT was among the lowest and so was the IMRT plan. Here we have the esophagus and you'll see that the 3D case in this, the 3D technique in this instance did perhaps perform the worst um, while the IMRT and some of the hybrids actually were a little better. Again, the heart in this instance was not an issue, uh, just based on where the, lo the location of the heart was uh, versus where the location of the tumor was. And now this brings us to our key points for patient number two. So comorbidity was probably the biggest issue we had. You saw in that slide prior where the ipsilateral lung was completely collapsed. Um, another issue was the location of the tumor volume. And uh, the body habitus, being that the shoulders were in the field, you know, special attention had to be made. Then our OAR hierarchy just follows in line with RTOG 0839. First it's the spinal cord, then the combined lung, the esophagus, and finally the heart. And here we have planning trade-offs. So we had better sparing of the esophagus and combined lung versus an increased treatment time with some of our other planning modalities. So here we felt that the best overall plan was the IMRT plan. It had very low lung dose. Um, uh, the, mean lung do the mean esophageal dose was very low. And it also had great conformality. Okay. We're almost there. Case number three was a 46-year-old female uh, who presented with dysphagia for one year. 
An upper endoscopy at the time revealed an abnormal area of esophagus. A biopsy was performed on and was positive for squamous cell carcinoma, non-keratinizing. A PET CT was performed and revealed a prominent abnormal hypermetabolic uptake consistent with the four centimeter length of abnormality in the proximal esophagus. Here's a good instance where the tumor location and the shape of the tumor greatly impacted our planning. As you'll notice, the CTV is very, very close to our, our spinal cord. Uh, in some areas for this particular patient, we measured less than 1.5 centimeters, as well as the concavity of the PTV, which basically made it so that some of our planning techniques wouldn't satisfy our cord constraints. Here, our 3D plan was a little more complex. We have a six field uh, arrangement with wedges. Next, we have an IMRT plan with five fields. In the middle, two full arcs. And again, our hybrid IMRT, which was 50% APPA and 50% of the five field uh, previously mentioned. And finally, the hybrid VMAT, which was the APP again with our two full arcs in conjunction. So here you'll see the PTV, and if you notice, the, structure, the outline in red is our 3D CRT plan. And you'll notice that it didn't even meet the constraint, as I had alluded to. And if you look at the conformality index down on the left, you'll see that it was well under one, meaning, again, we couldn't satisfy the PTV constraint. Um, well, all other plans were able to minimize the high dose leakage, if you'll notice. <clears throat> okay, with this particular patient, meeting the spinal cord constraint proved to be too much for some of our techniques. Uh, even when reducing the coverage, the 3D CRT plan still did not meet our spinal cord constraints. And while we did not scale back the dose for the hybrid IMRT, you'll notice that we weren't able to meet that constraint for that particular plan as well. Um, only three out of the five plans run were able to meet this constraint. Therefore, those are still in the running for our quote unquote best plan. Um, but this case is a good example of how in the past with 3D planning, you would have to sacrifice dose coverage or you'd have to you know, reduce your total dose in order to spare some of your, your organs at risk. And we also know that by reducing dose and reducing the coverage, we increase the likelihood of recurrence. Um, again, we have our combined lung dose. And you'll see that it's very hard to see, maybe, but some of the plans did much better than others. And in this case, we felt that the VMAP plan was among the highest in terms of combined lung doses, while the IMRT was actually, the IMRT and the, the hybrid plans were actually among the best. Here we have the heart. And again, this was not an issue based on the location of the tumor. It was so far superior that we just caught a small portion of the heart in our inferior portion of the PTV. And you'll see the, the graph looks a little high, but we're talking about 5% to like 3% in terms of you know our V40, which is virtually nothing. So again, our key points, we'd like to point out the tumor location again. Uh, the PTV, as I had mentioned, was very close to the spinal cord. Um, and that really defined what we were going to do in terms of our final technique. Uh, the tumor shape, I had mentioned that the concavity really made it difficult, again, uh, in conjunction with the, the distance from the tumor, to shape the dose uh, appropriately around the PTV. Our OAR hierarchy was, you know, in conjunction, spinal cord, combined lung, and heart, and, you know, Based on that one spinal cord criteria, if you can't meet that spinal cord criteria, that plan, no matter how good it does in other criteria, has to be eliminated. Um, so our planning trade-offs were spinal cord versus other OARs. If you can't meet that constraint, again, that plan has to be eliminated. And our best overall plan in this particular instance, we felt there were two, the IMRT and the hybrid VMAT. Um, both were able to satisfy all our criteria uh, they, were, they were both able to cover PTV adequately, and they both had a very low yet acceptable conformality index. The spinal cord constraint was met, and the combined lung doses were among the lowest. 
In this case, the tumor was predominantly located above the lungs, which proved to be beneficial to the plans that typically yield higher combined lung doses, for example, VMAT and IMRT. Um, we're almost there. We're at our final patient. He's a 65-year-old male who presented with a three-month history of dysphagia and new weight loss. An endoscopy was performed and revealed a semi-circumferential mass from five centimeters distal to the upper esophageal sphincter and extending eight centimeters. Endoscopic biopsy was positive for moderately to poorly differentiated, differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So now we'll go through the contour evaluation one more time. And you'll see that this tumor was very midline. There was some overlap with the heart and, again, the greater vessels. And also you'll see the distance between the target volume and the spinal cord as well. Going from left to right, we have our three-field technique. Uh, which was comprised of an AP field with two, with an LAO and an RPO. Next, we have a five field IMRT. In the middle, two full arcs. And at the end, we have an APPA, an IMRT hybrid, and finally, an APPA and VMAT hybrid. It might be a little less noticeable, but again, the 3D CRT plan was not able to get the PTV constraint just for spinal cord coverage. Um, but if you look at the conformality index down at the bottom, you'll notice that it's 1.31, which means that while the PTV was not covered appropriately, there was, it still was above, meaning more um, high dose was outside of the target volume, which is unacceptable. Um, next, we have our spinal cord dose. And you'll see that we did meet all the constraints uh, with the 3D CRT but we did have to block some of the PTV in order to do so. Um, next on our list, again, is the combined lung. And here you'll see that the VMAP plan was unable to satisfy some of our, uh, some of our, v, our V5 constraint, our V10 constraint, while others were just barely meeting. Um, but I would like to point out that the, IMO, that the hybrid plans did adequately cover the combined lung. Here's the heart. And again, as I mentioned, the heart was in the field. So you will see some plans do better than others. In this case, the VMAT and IMRT were amongst the lowest in heart sparing. Uh, but again, the graph is somewhat misleading because 8% is still very much lower than, than the, the RTOG constraint that they have set. So our key points for case number four, again, is tumor location and size. Um, it was very much midline. And um, it was very long in terms of its superior to inferior extension, uh, measuring almost 17 centimeters in the soup to inf direction. Um, had it been shorter, some of the other modalities might have done better in terms of meeting the combined lung doses. But for this particular case, some of them could not. Our OAR hierarchy, again, is simply in accordance with the RTOG protocol, spinal cord, combined lung, and heart. And almost all planning techniques met the spinal cord constraints. As I mentioned, the 3D CRT plan had to be truncated off the spinal cord in order to meet the spinal cord constraint. Um, the best plans in terms of minimizing lung doses were the plans that utilized the benefits of APPA fields, and those were the hybrid plans in this case. Um, and they were also able to uh, spare the lowest combined lung. Again, trade-offs were, were made. Um, and in this case, they were negligible. And they were simply following the RTOG hierarchy. And in instances occur, as we have mentioned, where a patient might present with comorbidities, that would also directly impact the treatment technique chosen. In our opinion, the plans that best satisfied our planning goals were the, high, were the plans uh, our best overall plans were the plans that satisfied all our goals. And in this case, they were the hybrid IMRT and the hybrid VMAT. And now I'd like to reintroduce uh, my colleague and co-presenter, Corinne L, to deliver our conclusion. All right. Are we still awake? <laughs> Um, if you're asleep now, this is the time to wake up because we're going to summarize everything that we've talked about in the next two minutes. Uh, so when we evaluated each case, we evaluated um, five different plans. Now in practice, uh, running five different plans for any single patient 
is a little cumbersome. We don't have that kind of time. It's being idealistic. Now, maybe if doctors complete their contours on time, that might be a different story. Are any doctors in the room? Um, all right, so what we've learned from this study is that there are certain key triggers that will dictate your planning approach to thoracic tumors. So, trigger one, tumor location. If I'm looking at a plan and I see that the lesion is considerably away from critical structures, like we saw in case, case one with the peripheral lesion, my planning approach would lean more towards a 3D or 3D uh, weighted hybrid plan. Uh, so in order to save as much of the contralateral healthy lung as possible. Similarly, if the tumor extends superiorly towards the shoulders, as seen in case two, we would probably opt for an IMRT plan in order to really reduce um, the dose to those areas and avoid them. Trigger two, tumor shape. Thoracic tumors are often irregular as we know, and oftentimes 3D plans aren't able to compensate for the irregularity without exceeding dose to critical structures that we saw from the PTV concavity in case three. And that's where an IMRT or VMAT would come into the picture to carve and shape the dose around this area. However, we also need to think about the precedence of conformality and consequently the increased low dose spread to normal tissue from the IMRT and the VMAT in particular the V5 and the V10. So this increase in low dose can in turn affect toxicity, which also ties back into patient comorbidities and his or her ability to um, tolerate specific doses to critical structures, such as the combined lung. And that's where you really uh, gain a lot from the nature of the hybrid. So tumor location and size are your triggers here. So as Phil showed you in case four, the location of the tumor was very mediastinal and central without much extension into the periphery. And that's where you'll see the most benefit from the hybrid plan. And as the length of the mediastinal tumor increases, your combined lung dose will only benefit that much more. So in conclusion, to come full swing, let's re return to the focal point of our presentation. As we said from the beginning, when we, when we talked about innovation, we're somewhat conditioned to think that these newer methods are probably better. And in some cases, they are. We're able to realize target doses that we weren't able to achieve before. And we're able to compensate for irregular tumor shapes and generate um, conformal plans that really minimizes the dose to the critical structures. Um, however, as we've learned, no single method is uh, perfect, and each will come with its trade-offs. So what we've learned and hope that we've passed on to you is that given the advantages and disadvantages of given treatment techniques, uh, plans can be customized um, to irregular tumor shapes, uh, sizes, patient comorbidities, physician preferences, and things of that nature. And sometimes, um, in some cases, the integration of dual methods, namely the hybrid, can combine the best of both worlds. Thank you. Uh, just some special thanks to uh, the following people. Um, this was our first presentation, so um, the fact that they took time out in order to uh, really help us in their busy schedules and stuff uh, was, was really appreciated. Um, you know, everyone's really busy and there's always stuff going on, so we really wanted to dedicate time to, to, thank, to thank the following people. Oh, they can't see it. All right, so I'll just name them. So Dr. Sean Zimberg, Dr. Andrew Perlman, uh, John Keane, which I believe is sitting in the audience somewhere, uh, Julie Yuan, uh, Tim Colm, Todd Yoder, and uh, Chris Smith. So some, these are some of our references that we used. And are there any questions uh, that any of you have? Thank you. Just curious, um, what was your margin for your PTV and in your 3D plans, how much, um, what did you use to define the field edge? The margin? Yeah. So first question, from your CTV to PTV, mm -hmm. what was the margin that you used? Oh, it was really MD specific because we were looking at uh, cases um, on from an individual standpoint. Okay. We were comparing plans that were just within themselves. So typically that ranged from 1 to 2 cm. Um, it really depended on, you know, the MIP scan, the PET-CT, you know, things of that nature. 
So it wasn't um, an analysis that incorporated, you know, um, right. But I, from, I'm sorry, no, but I think uh, you did mention the 3D planning, correct? Yeah. Yes. So That's when we would take that PTV margin, we would also expand seven millimeters beyond PTV for our 3D expand for our for your block edge. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, because then you can't really compare if you go to PTV edge. How does this planning affect uh, length of planning time, QA time, and treatment time? Um, the planning time, um, you know, the hybrid plans, they're pretty much in accordance with your VMAT plans. If you're running VMAT and if you're running IMRT, they're pretty much in accordance with your IMRT. We've seen that our first run, if we're doing just a 50-50 split, could just be about an hour in terms of, you know, its planning. Uh, sometimes, you know, if we're running a second one with a different weighting scheme, you know, it could be another hour, unfortunately. Uh, the way Eclipse works is we're using base dose planning. So it does have to restart from the beginning. Um, but the QA really doesn't take much longer. You know, we're using uh, 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 PTW Octavian Phantom. So if we're running, you know, IMRT or VMAT, we can, you know, still do it in the same amount of time. Because um, we're not really QAing the 3D fields. We're just QAing the, the modulated fields. And we're taking uh, 3D daily doses for the actual uh, 3D fields. Yes. Yeah, I think um, we always kind of struggle in our clinic with the trade-off between IMRT, where the V5 and the V10 are very high, uh, versus the 3D, where you're limited by location, uh, core dose, uh, perhaps compromise on the PTV coverage. Um, so we typically would end up with a 3D that has uh, small segments to kind of make up the area um, that's deep behind the cord. But I had a suggestion maybe instead of running two different plans, why not create an IMRT plan uh, that is based off of more 3D type beam arrangements. So you'd have two to three, uh, you know, AP-ish um, treatment fields, maybe not uh, around 20 degrees from AP, same thing with the PA, um, and it gives the, the optimization enough room to wiggle that dose in and still keep it all in the mediastinum instead of all over the place. I, I think the problem with that is then you start to lose the conformality. I think if you bottle all your anterior and posterior fields in a very small section, you start to see a bowing out of the isodoses, which in our instances, sometimes it's not ideal. So uh, it's, a good, it's a good suggestion, but you know, I guess depending on where, what your physicians and physicists are you know, looking for, you, know, you, could tr you could certainly implement that. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.